Hey, this is Tracy. Before we get to the next episode of the Eating at a Meeting podcast, I have a question for you. Are you ready to make 2021 the year you never say managing dietary needs is challenging? Listen, I know how hard it is to manage the plethora of requests from attendees who say they're pescatarian, gluten-free, dairy-free, allergic to this, allergic to that, or combination of all of those. I've been there and I have helped my clients create more memorable experiences for their attendees. And that's why I'm here to tell you that I've actually created a new online course called Every Meal Matters that I will teach you how to meet all these dietary requests and the legal requirements that go with them so you can create delicious menus for all your attendees without having to pull your hair out. Registration is now open at academy.thrivemeetings.com and the course launches on Monday, January 11th. I hope you'll join me for this new class that will empower you to provide more inclusive food and beverage experiences that help everyone feel valued. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Eating at a Meeting podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Stuckrath, dietary needs expert, certified meetings manager, certified food protection manager. I have searched the globe to find people and businesses who are creating safe, sustainable, and inclusive food and beverage experiences for their employees, guests, and communities. In each episode, you will find authentic conversations about how food and beverage impacts inclusion, sustainability, culture, community, health, and wellness. I know that sounds like a lot, but we're gonna cover it all. Are you ready to feed engagement? nourish inclusion and bolster your bottom line? If so, let's go. Hi, everybody. I'm Tracy Stuckrath with Thrive Meetings and Events and the host of the Eating at a Meeting podcast, which you're listening to right now. Thanks for joining us. On this podcast, we talk about food and beverage and experts in all facets of food and beverage so that we can become more familiar with everything that goes into putting food on our plate. We've talked to doctors and farmers and eaters and dietitians and so many different people so far in the podcast. And I'm excited to talk to um, Doreen Cumberford today. She is a coach, speaker, and author who helps expats and global nomads in their life work balance in order to fulfill their assignments overseas with more joy. The one thing that I love about Doreen is that she's lived all over the world and she's eaten amazing food everywhere. And her perspective of what food means to us is really intriguing to me. She's an expat veteran of over four decades and continues to meet people and eat as she continues to travel the globe. She is also the author of Life in the Camel Lane, Embrace the Adventure, Arriving Well, Home Again, and Home Again, Jiggity Jig and an upcoming new work called When the Music Stops. So Doreen, I can't wait to talk to you. Yay, how are you? It's great. Yeah, thank you for having me, Tracy. I've looked forward to this conversation for a long time. I love talking yeah. about food. The intersection of food and culture is a fascinating place to be. Well, in all your experiences, you know, traveling the world as an expat, and maybe we should explain what that means to people and how you got there, but I think it it adds so much more culture and experience to it, and the stories that you have around eating in those experiences or in those environments is really intriguing. So can you tell everybody how you became an expat? Certainly. And what that I- means? Yes, certainly. I grew up in Scotland, in Glasgow, Scotland. I won't put on my Glasgow accent for this recording, though. And um, when growing up in Glasgow, I really had the seed planted in my head when I was about six years old. Um, And my mother decided to have Russian KGB officers come and live in our house, which was very interesting. Oh, wow. But that was the seed of me understanding that there were different cultures, languages, Um, and everything around culture and food and language was fascinating. So my first job was with Her Majesty's Foreign and Commonwealth Office, my first real job, let's say, big girl job. And uh, I was hired as a very, very, very junior member of the diplomatic service. 
And uh, I moved from Glasgow to London. And most people at that time wanted to go to either Beirut or Tehran. They were the real hot spots that everybody wanted to go. So Doreen found herself volunteering to go to Cameroon, West Africa. In fact, the capital is Yaoundé. Okay. And in Yaoundé, um, it was a French colony originally. And our food arrived by plane on a Thursday night. What do you mean? You couldn't get food there? There was local food. There were plantains and there were strange animals called cutting grass. I'm not quite sure what I ate there. Um, and we had plenty of uh -huh. mangoes and we had plenty of papayas and plenty of uh, avocados. I mean, we really had lots and lots of fresh food and some fruit and veggies in the jungle. But it was a French colony. And because it was a French colony, the French had for years, in fact, decades, had a plane come in every week from France and it had foie gras and pâté and the enormous strawberries wow. and incredible fish, fresh fish and things that we couldn't get because we would have been limited to the local diet. And so that was one of my first experiences was living as an expat, number one, but one of my first amazing food experiences living overseas. Yeah. Yeah. Every Thursday night was like Christmas. I mean, we would, we would all go down and we would show up at this restaurant and we'd sit at long tables. It'd be like 20 or 30 of us, you know, all uh -huh. the expats, white people in, a, in an African nation. Right. And, um, we would just be like amazed at the things that came off the plane that were fresh, you know, all kinds of fresh wow. food and, all, and from France. So that was such, uh, and, and it made the posting because that's the thing I remember the most that was the best about living in that part of Africa. At that time, I was so privileged. I get that. I was very spoiled and very privileged. That's but it was the culture was built around the food. And we were from all different nationalities, all the embass embassy people. And we gathered around the food and made each other welcome. It was fascinating. That is interesting. And so everybody that was eating that food were all expats that you were working with? Yeah. Yeah, they were all people who were either working for NGOs and charities and um, things like uh, World Health Organization, OECD, um, the United Nations, um, embassies. And we had a Swiss embassy, a French embassy, a Canadian embassy. And so we had people from all around the world gathered at that table on a Thursday night. And it wasn't, you know, the food connected us, but the conversation. That's amazing. Yeah, it was great. It was just amazing. So that was, you know, one of my first experiences of recognizing how important food is to culture. Mm -hmm. Very much so. So how, and then since then, I mean, you've lived um, in Japan and you've lived yeah. in the UAE and yeah. I mean, you've had this and you live in Colorado now. I mean, that's a wide very big breadth of different cultures and yes, how has that how has that influenced your food and beverage what's at your table now well um i find myself eating simpler and simpler because as you know um my husband and i are semi retired uh, but we do house sitting i do i write and i coach and i and i speak but um we do global pet sitting and so we find that we have to adjust everywhere we go. So I think our diet has become simpler and simpler, um, especially when we're in America. I think it's uh, it, it becomes limited because we're always trying to find the freshest food, the healthiest food, but we miss certain things. So, you know, we'll, we'll go to Mexico uh, in, in a month and we'll, we'll try different foods again. Um, but I think the older we get, the less food we need. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the more important 
I, I really am beginning to value food more than I ever have in the past. And why so is that? I think, I think because of the presence of so much packaged food and so much um, synthetic food and so much prepared food. Because mm-hmm. when that food came from um, when that food came from France to Cameroon, it was mm-hmm. fresh on the plane and fresh off the plane. And there's one restaurant in Colorado that does that, and that's Sushi Den, because the chef's brother lives in Tokyo. He goes down to the market in Tokyo in the morning, and he gets the fresh uh-huh. sushi, puts it on the plane, flies it to Denver, it arrives at our airport, and wow. then it's... And then within 24 hours, it's on your plate. But that's, that's rare. Amazing. Yeah. But it's rare. That doesn't happen at very many places, does it? No. It, that reminds me, though, I was in um, Shanghai, I think it was two years ago, and I went to this restaurant, top of the tower and all of this stuff, and I had Boston or North New England lobster for dinner. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, this is not sustainable. But it was done. They put it in a mason jar and steamed it inside that mason jar with lemongrass and lime juice. It was so good. Yeah. But it was, say, you know, that same thing flown on a plane that day to get to us. Yeah. I, and that's not sustainable. I think what we have to do is um, I really like to support the local farmers. I really like to support the the markets. And, you know, going up to Boulder or going downtown somewhere and and finding the people that are growing the food themselves. I mean, that is such a treasure and such a joy for me. It's also very time-consuming and can be quite expensive. So Mm -hmm. I recognize that that is a privilege, and I would like to see that move from being privileged to being normal. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, I shop at the Newburn Farmer's Market every single Saturday. Mm-hmm. And I go see Stephen and I go see Fred and the other and um, from Marlowe's uh, Microgreens, Harlow's Microgreens. And I love to go visit them and I check their Instagram account before I go to see what they've got. And yeah, I love it. It's really, yeah. it, it really ties you to, directly to the food. It does, and you and you feel so much more connected, um, yes. you know. Food, but food can be weaponized as well because um, yes. when I lived in uh, Louisiana, I married a fellow in the Middle East, but he was from originally Mississippi, and I came. Somebody who'd worked like in lived in Scotland, worked in the Foreign Office, been to worked in Africa, worked other places in the Middle East, met this fellow and moved to Louisiana. That's and a big culture shock. <laughs> huge culture shock, but huge food culture shock for me because I didn't know the difference between an etouffee and a, you know, something else. I just had no clue. I didn't know that a lady finger was the name of a vegetable. I had I was just <laughs> clueless, Tracy. But um, my in-laws kind of treated me as if I was clueless, and I was. But the way that I earned my way into that family was by learning to cook Cajun food. And so it was interesting interesting. because the food became weaponized. It became like Mm -hmm. codified and you know let's see how good her roux is and you know let's see and and for me I just like stepped into the challenge and thought well I can I can you know I can do this this isn't hard (laughs) and I figured I figured out how to cook now I don't cook like that anymore because my values have changed my food values have changed over the years I I don't I no longer value roux because there's so much butter in them I mean they're they're (laughs) terrific but I don't eat that every right. week. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So, so culture the and the use of food is, sorry, the culture and the use of food and how we use food is fascinating. It really is. And one of the, when I asked you earlier, um, in a 
previous conversation was what does safe and inclusive food and beverage mean to you? And there's one word that you use that I just love. Um, the word welcome. Was it welcome? And, yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, yeah. Food is never about food. I attended the San Miguel de Allende Writers Conference earlier this year in Mexico. And I went to a, a food writers mm -hmm. workshop. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm a writer. I like food. I figured, well, I'll go find out what that's about. I'll just, you know, just experiment. Uh -huh. And just as I thought, the first thing she said was, Food is never about food. And writing about food is never about the food. And I was like, that's what I believe too. This is fascinating. And then I came home and I thought about it more. And I thought, you know, it really is the art of welcome. And living in Saudi Arabia, as we did for 15 years, um, the greatest thing that I learned there was how to create a welcome for people. And it really is, uh, it's, it's doing less, but it's doing simple things. And it's actually, uh, it's a rite of passage. It's a sacrament. It's uh -huh. sacred. It's a, it's a ritual. It's not just eating to sustain yourself. It's eating to welcome the new life that you want in your body. That's interesting. And then you were also talking you know, welcoming people to the table and you had that whole group of people in Cameroon and it reminds me of the refugees and people using the food to welcome them into the neighborhood or welcome, you know, showing them, hey, this is me. This is where I came from. Yes. You know, yeah. let me show you what I can bring. And that's, and it's usually food. It is. And, and one of the first experiences I had in Arabia it was going out to the Bedouin tents out in the desert. And when you go to the Bedouin tents, they're not expecting you. And when there's, you don't make an appointment, you don't get an invitation, you're just kind of driving around and you go, oh, that's an interesting tent. Oh, maybe, there, maybe there'd be something interesting to, to go explore. And so the Bedou and the Bedouin have, from Abraham's time, actually broken bread and actually welcome people. Now, frequently back then, they would welcome people because they wanted to see whether they were friends or enemies, what their motives were, and what they could learn, because that was how news traveled. Right. So I remember going to the Bedouin tents and them taking me into the ladies section because, you know, split. There's there's a welcoming area where everybody can be, but the women are usually not in that area. But then they would take Lindsay, my daughter and I into the women's area where they would be um, cooking and making things. And everywhere you go in Saudi Arabia, if you're in a shop or you're in a store, the first thing they do, you don't talk about anything until you've discussed the hospitality and the hospitality starts with can we get you a drink would you like tea coffee a soda and they probably don't even have it on premises so they send a runner and he runs down the street to the little store and he comes back with whatever you wanted so the art of welcome was practiced before the art of meeting or greeting or business or anything else and we put our daughter up on these, you know, 10 feet high carpets when she was like two or three years old. We'd prop her up there and we'd give her something to drink she liked. And she'd be happy for hours just watching everything that went on. And, and it was that sense of welcome. And it was only one beverage. It didn't cost them a lot. So when you go to the Bedou, they make you the cardamom coffee, which is actually like a tea with cardamom seeds swimming around on the top. Okay. But I mean, I love that. I just loved it because I felt yeah. welcome. And if you feel welcome at a meeting and you feel welcome at the yeah. table, mm -hmm. your experience of the food is, in my opinion, is a little different. Oh, I agree with that. Yeah. I mean, because it's, it's saying, hello, I want to have this conversation with you. I want you to be part of my life. I want to learn something new about you. And let's share that together. It's a sharing experience. Yeah, exactly. that's really so interesting. And yeah. what, um, 
tell me more about, well, we already talked about that. I was just going to ask you about the welcome thing. The, I lost my train of thought. What? Shoot. We're going to cut that right out right now. And we're going to, let me go back to my question. Um, The, so I is going to ask you about the, you worked at the diet center franchise. So, yeah. Okay. So you, one of your jobs throughout your career was to actually work at a diet center franchise. Yeah. How, talk about how that was in, in coaching people that way, but also taking the, the food culture that you've brought from so many different experiences. Well, that was fascinating. I owned a diet center franchise in Louisiana. Oh, okay. And of course, food is a huge cultural difference in Louisiana. So when people came in and went on the program, they had to change their culture. They weren't just changing their eating habits. They were actually changing their Mm -hmm. way of being because they were changing the very DNA and the very cells of their bodies by eating differently. Yeah. And, you know, to this day, I still eat towards the diet center program. I mean, I still eat a little bit of um, chicken and, and fish and really light protein and lots of fruits and veggies and that sort of thing. So that influenced me tremendously. But it also taught me a lot about one particular corner of America, and that was New Orleans and New Orleans food. And it took me until I moved to California, and now I'm in Colorado. Um, I've like moved, well, I've lived in four states, also the Pacific Northwest. And what I see is the different cultures and how they interact with food and how they use food in in different parts of America. You cannot talk about Mm -hmm. this country as if it's a just one unit. We are all different. Yep. Yeah. I mean, food from where I was in Atlanta to North Carolina, I mean, think about just different types of barbecue in and of itself, you know, going up and down the East coast to the South and then going across. What does that barbecue mean? Yes. Um, Depends on where you are. Mm -hmm. And so it, it definitely is, we are, we are a melting pot of variety of different ways, but food is definitely that way as well. Um, one of the other things that I really liked about um, one of your experiences that was the setting up of the tables. You had a story about that, the, um, you know, when you bring in people and how you set those tables up and what that means to, and bringing us back to that word, welcome. Um, in the, one of the, one of my, fondest memories of Saudi Arabia is returning there in 2015. Um, We had hoped we would be there again by now, but the last time was 2015. And I remember we had a meal out by the water, out by the bay, and they'd set down all the tables outside. And they have these beautiful, you know, Middle Eastern candles that are very flickering, very patterned and and a huge platter on the table with the rice and the chicken and because kapsa is very, very, it's the most popular dish in Saudi Arabia. Of course, it's, you know, eaten pans and then put on your plate. But besides that, they had so many other little things on the table that when you come into that situation, you just feel really welcome because you feel like people have worked so hard and there's an honoring of the time and the energy spent by the people that have prepared it, which we don't get when we go to meetings in this country. You know, mm-hmm. the chef yep. is kind of like way in the kitchen and you're lucky if he comes out and says, how was your chicken? You know, um, that, I'm just talking about meetings now, not restaurants. <laughs> um, but that's mostly <laughs> my experience of corporate meetings is, you know, they might come out and say, how was it? But this is something that um, people prepared all day. Now, in the Middle East, when you break your fast at Ramadan, it's a big deal because you've been fasting all day. And so we right. went, we would go to um, Jordanian and um, Palestinian friends' houses and they would have other people and it would just feel like family. It felt 
it felt more family than family feels to me nowadays because wow. that sense of welcome was there. They had taken the time. They had prepared certain things. There were traditional things. And, you know, a lot of times my one of my best friends and my favorite hostesses, she hadn't necessarily cooked the food because she was in a privileged position where she had um, a maid that worked in the house or two maids that worked in the house. And so they did a lot of the preparation, but she was also very hands-on. So it taken the three of them all afternoon and maybe days before to prepare some of the stuff. Yep. And, you know, there's a sense of honoring that time put in. And there's, and I think having a set table, if you have a table, I think it should always have something on it. It should always have some kind of a table setting. Anywhere you go, if you go in and you see a table setting, you feel more welcome usually, don't you? If you go into a store and you see a set table. So that's just part of the philosophy of welcome. And, and it's a great way to build diversity and inclusion, which I know you're starting to talk a lot about. Yes, definitely. And it is, it's definitely creating that no matter where you're coming from. So just going back to your dinner at at Cameroon, it didn't matter where everybody was coming from. That food was being shared with everybody from across the world. And, and granted, some people may not have been able to eat it or chose not to eat certain parts of that, but it was that shared meal that they had. Um, Just, a story just popped into my head that when you said, when you like to see that place setting is my friend, Lori, that I worked with uh, probably 15, 20 years ago, whenever she ordered takeout, she would always take it out of the container and put it on a plate and get silverware Yes, because she wanted to make sure that she was experiencing that meal the way that it was meant to be instead of eating it out of the styrofoam or the cardboard box or things like that. And I think with COVID right now, we have to, we're not, if people are ordering stuff, there's a lot of takeout. So, but you know, if you're bringing it home, take it out and put it on that plate and open up that experience for what it's supposed to meant to be. Yeah. And make it a ritual because it is eating is a ritual. Mm -hmm. Meetings are rituals, but eating is a ritual that we perform every day. And if you make I think there's some energetic woo-woo kind of magic around all of this that you probably don't want to get into. But I I do think if, if when we're mindful of what we're putting in our bodies and how we're using our bodies and what our intentions are, that that echoes out into the world in the form of your intention. So I think that eating with intention, and even if it is takeout, You know, bless the chef, thank the chef, be great, practice great gratitude around the food that you have food. Right. Yeah, definitely. And, and especially right now with everything going on, I mean, we, we need to be grateful that they're still there to, to feed us and for us to actually have the opportunity to help them feed their families at the same time by taking out from them or, or going to their restaurant. Um, jumping back to the diversity and inclusion, it, it's definitely something that I talk about. And because we are diverse in so many ways, and whether it's what country you're from or what part of the country you're from, because even in India, there's a variety of different dietary needs and preferences and styles, and just like the United States. And, you know, uh, yeah, we <laughs> have to accept those different diversities of that and figure out how to be that inclusive inclusive thing. But I think what you said was making it with intent. And I think whoever's placing the orders for the food and beverage have to think about the intent instead of just saying, oh my God, we got to have lunch, right? Let's just order this. But thinking about what's the intent of that meal you're about to serve and can that food enhance that intent Um, or are you, what you're ordering, is it going to hurt the intent of that meal at the same time? Yeah. Yeah. I I do think there's a lot for chefs to think about the, and I think this is why some of the really high end restaurants are successful, quite frankly, Mm -hmm. because they really think through their concept. 
And they mm-hmm. really think through the experience of the person. What is the experience? What experience is that person having in the ambiance and the situation? And mm-hmm. when they leave, how do they want them to feel? And so I do think that that's very important for all of us and everybody in the food and beverage industry um, to consider that and maybe just slow down. And if there's one extra thing you can do, for instance, maybe you can always, maybe you can just put a piece of rosemary on a piece of fish. But, Mm -hmm. you know, that sprig of, Fresh rosemary makes a difference. Yeah. Or maybe you can serve an ice cream and have a tiny piece of lavender on the side. You know, yep. it doesn't take a lot and it doesn't have to be expensive. And when you look at the way the French, my gosh, celebrate food, um, it it's it, it's just fascinating to me to to watch them and to and to listen to them and to participate because they make such a big deal out of it. And I yeah. think that feeds the soul. It feeds the invisible part of us that needs to be fed mm-hmm. as well as just the physical part of us. Yeah, and you in our previous conversations, you you were talking about how they take the time to sit down and they enjoy that meal and they eat it slowly and they have the conversations with people. And in a lot of meetings and events, you know, whether it's a staff meeting or a convention, it's like, okay, we've got an hour to feed everybody. And I actually did an event for a large client and they wanted everybody fed within 15,000 people fed in 45 minutes. And I'm like, that and it was just, it was outside and it was you know food trucks and tents and all of that stuff but i'm like let them take the time to enjoy the experience that you're spending and putting on for them in this large huge park and you know and but not shove it down their throat that they're going to they have to eat in 45 minutes yeah think about that intent and those so many more conversations happen around a table that you can share with food exactly and and i think you and i have talked before uh, meant more than once about this about the fact that uh, when you go to a meeting and then uh you've been in a meeting all morning you've been sitting all morning you've been listening you've been attentive and then they give you homework to do during the meal and they expect you to eat in like 35 minutes and you're expected to network you're expected to eat you're expected to do homework and then somebody comes up and and does a presentation in the middle of the, of the meal. I'm sorry, but I think we need to slow down and COVID has been good for that and become more mindful about what is the priority here? Mm -hmm. And how do we manage? How do we, um, I think you can have an even deeper and more meaningful experience by frequently slowing it down, personalizing it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Personalizing is very important in that whole inclusion aspect as well. And not that you can personalize 7,000 meals if that's how many people you have, but little touches here and there, somebody out of the blue is going to think that that was personalized for them. And that little experience um, is going to mean so much to somebody that you didn't even it wasn't intentional, right? But it can be intentional. Yes. Okay. So we're getting close to our um, 30 minute mark and we may have actually gone over it a little bit, but that's okay. Two things. Um, what is a best practice in all of this stuff that you've you've experienced? And I, we've talked about it a little bit, but specifically, do you have any best practices that you think you've, that you've seen in all of your eating travels that could be, Um, put forward on other future food and beverage events? Hmm, That's a very good question. I'm not sure you've asked me that before, but I do think the personalization of food is critical. Okay. Um, Yep. I do think some consideration of what the vision is for the experience is really important. 
And Mm -hmm. I do think some thought and forward planning and considering, you know, are people gluten-free? You know, sometimes um, I've been gluten-free pretty much, you know, 95% of the time for 10 years now. Um, And sometimes dairy-free for long periods of time. And sometimes that used to be perceived as, oh, the problem child is here. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, you know, (laughs) you fill it up. Fortunately, that is being um, addressed really well. But what I would love to see addressed simultaneously nowadays is the sense of making everyone welcome and um, and making it pers- more personalized. And I don't have any specifics, but I'll need to think about that. <laughs> no worries. Okay, so how can everyone get a hold of you? Oh, I'm at uh, DoreenMCumberford.com or... Um, you can find me on LinkedIn and uh, or Life in the Camelade. I think I sent you the links, yes? You did. You, you sent me the link for the book. So I will make sure everybody's got that when we post like this. And, and just on social media, I'm on Facebook. And um, uh, you can find me under Reentry Rock Stars if you're interested in the subject of returning home, particularly returning home from overseas. And I about adventure, how to create, how to create adventure even in a di- an ordinary day, and that could be food, could be part of it. Mm-hmm. Definitely, yep. And that's there's lots of good foodie tours out there um, that you can do in person, and but I think a lot of them have converted them to be virtual. So mm-hmm. looking through all of those and and seeing what you can experience, you know, worldwide, it's the COVID has really helped us open up those experiences and maybe you can't eat it here, but you can learn about it. Yeah. Okay. So with all of your travels, what is you, do you have a favorite food or beverage? Oh my gosh. Uh, I have memories of foods that feed my soul. And the last time you asked me a question like this, I told you about sugar bread in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking I should read a book, uh, write a book about food and travel because there's so much coming out here. Um, I remember cooking a meal in October 2019 in the Dordogne uh, while I was pet sitting for a lady in the Dordogne at a an old abandoned farmhouse that had been rehabilitated with a beautiful um, extension added onto it. And she had a great kitchen. And so I sent my husband to the store. I said, hey, honey, would you go get uh, a kilo or two kilos of um, beef for beef bourguignon? Well, he came back and it was 40 euros a kilo. (laughs) Oh, wow. It was 40 euros, which is, you know, about $50. And um, he came back with that meat and I cooked it in her kitchen with her spices and everything there. And she had a great kitchen and it came out absolutely fabulous. And I was so thrilled because when she came back, she said she'd never had a house or pet sitter make a meal like that in her kitchen before. And, you know, just those kinds of experiences, taking the time, putting the energy into it, making it really nice. And it was easy. I used Julia Child's beef bourguignon recipe, which is time. <laughs> and you cannot go wrong. And if you're in the middle of France, you just walk down to the next farm place and get, or the winery and get a bottle of red and bring it back and put it in and fix right. it if it's awful. <laughs> It's not hard. It's really not hard. <laughs> so that's one of my, that is one of my, um, I don't eat that very frequently, but that's kind of a go-to meal for me if I'm like really, really uh, hungry and need nurturing and it's cold and wet and rainy outside. And that, that's a meal that can ground you. You know, with the spices and the hardiness of it. And I and I love that. But I also that story takes me back to what you said at the very beginning, and that that, 
you know, food is not just about the food, you know, or eating is not just about the food. It's about that overall experience. And it was that woman's kitchen who you, which you really loved because it was this great kitchen. And, and the fact that she, she said no one else had cooked a meal like that in her kitchen, you know, that is a whole nother story around yes. that. Yes. Yeah. I think food is a lot, has a lot to do with place. Mm-hmm. And, um, I think our lives are affected by geography and we're prisoners of our geography way more than we understand. And so yeah. I think unlocking the key and seeking the food that is local, that is sustainable, that is healthy and lively, um, helps you create a better life ultimately. That's awesome. Well, we're going to end on that note. Thank you, Doreen, for being on the show. Thanks, Tracy, for um, having me. It was lots. Of, we've had some great conversations about food. Thank you so much for you're bringing, welcome for, for exposing all these memories. <laughs> we are that, and I love that. It's really good because food is memories, and I think that was actually from a movie. Um, but yeah, food is memories, and it it, and I'm glad that the memories conjure up or the food conjures up such good memories and sometimes probably not so good, but, um, but it, it brings back things and it welcomes us even to look at how we approach food and beverage in the future. So yes, I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, everyone, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank have everyone. Thank you for listening to the eating at a meeting podcast. Um, two episodes come out a week. You can find it on all your podcast, favorite podcast platforms, um, and you can go to eating at a meeting podcast.com to see as well to listen to them there. Um, they are also all of the transcripts are turned into blog posts as well. So you can also, if you want to read them, you can do that as well. So this is Tracy Starkworth with Thrive Meetings and Events and your host for Eating at a Meeting. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Eating at a Meeting podcast, where every meal matters. I'm Tracy Stuckrath, your food and beverage inclusion expert. Call me and let's get started right now on creating safe and inclusive food and beverage experiences for your customers, your employees, and your communities. Share the podcast with your friends and colleagues at our Eating at a Meeting Facebook page and on all podcast platforms. To learn more about me and receive valuable information, go to tracystuckrath.com and If you'd like more information on how to feed engagement, nourish inclusion, and bolster your bottom line, then visit eatingatameeting.com.